Grab yourself a Bailey's and hot chocolate and listen to the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance recommended. I am Dr. John H. Watson, the faithful chronicler of the most extraordinary and enigmatic figure of our times, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. It is I who have the dubious honor of recounting the case of the exploding Christmas puddings. A holiday mystery that tests not only the remarkable deductive powers of my esteemed colleague, but also the endurance of my own digestive system. It was a chilly December in the year of our Lord, 18-something or other, and London was aglow with the festive spirit, a spirit that was, I must confess, rather dampened by the sudden and inexplicable detonation of Christmas puddings. Here in the modest yet chaotic abode of 221B Baker Street, Holmes, in his usual fashion, was deeply engrossed in an activity that, to the untrained eye, may have appeared as a mere indolence, but was in fact a rigorous exercise of his unparalleled intellectual faculties. Uh, yes, Holmes? Hmm, thinking. Hmm. Hmm. Holmes, I implore you, can the violin endure a respite? It's Christmas, not a druidic pagan death ritual. Well spotted, Watson. I'm in fact playing the dismal dirge of the dusky druids for Christmas. Ironically, a time of cheer, goodwill, and perfect cover for the most ingenious of crimes. This cacophony is but a metaphor for the chaos of the human condition. If the human condition had a volume knob, now would be a splendid time to turn it down. What is this volume knob you speak of, my dear Watson? I am currently engaged in a rather groundbreaking investigation of my own design. Upon its completion, all that remains is to wait for someone to invent a suitable uh, uh, phonograph with uh, an adjustable acoustic horn to which I'll connect the knob. <laughs> Revolutionary, don't you think? Ah, Watson, your unyielding faith in the necessity of this so-called volume control, I dare say the only time you'll ever use that knob is in a moment of sheer auditory desperation. The only knob in this room, Holmes, is invariably the one offering unsolicited critiques of my avant-garde scientific endeavours. Mr. Holmes, there's a chap outside, and his appearance suggests he's been wrestling with more than just his conscience. He's a whirlwind of urgency and tweed. What's his name, Mrs. Hudson? No need to ask, Watson, as the man in question is no doubt a Barnaby Winklethorpe of 29 Copperfield Street, London, and the owner of the Spotted Dick Pudding Pantry. Good Lord, Holmes, how do you know all that? It's on the card I just handed to Mr. Holmes. Yes, yes. A card in my hand that I hope to find the splattering upon it is only a very distressed custard and not the ardour of its owner. One does prefer one's desserts without the added zest of human exuberance, Watson. Ooh, taste it, Holmes. Lick it to discover its nature. Dr. Watson, love, I've told you more times than I can count. Don't go waggling that tongue of yours round these parts. Here I am, sweating buckets to keep this place spick and span, and there you are, tasting every mystery spot like it's afternoon tea. One of these days, you'll get a taste of something not even your fancy doctrine can cure. Watson, while I commend your enthusiasm for empirical research, I must assert that the utilisation of one's tongue as a primary investigative tool is both unsanitary and, dare I say, completely disgusting. Especially vis-a-vis -vis things that only might be custard. To look anything unknown is as scientifically unsound as your mind. Thank you, Holmes. It's refreshing to see you appreciate my methods for once. Now, speaking of methods, I might add Barnaby Winklethorpe always carries a taxidermied peacock with him as a plus one at parties, and is obsessed with plums. Good Lord, Holmes. 
How did you ever guess that from this card? Mr. Winklethorpe has been standing behind you in the doorway, my dear Watson. Ever the keen observer of the human condition, I see. Your remarkable talent for overlooking the glaringly obvious is, as always, a source of both wonder and, I confess, a modicum of unmitigated repugnance. Uh, cheers, Holmes. <laughs> I quite agree. Uh, Mr. Winklethorpe, uh, do sit down, old chap. Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Holmes. Uh, as you know, I own a bakery, and I was catering a charity carnival to raise money for better dental care for the poor this Christmas. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Sorry, that's the peacock, I'm afraid. It gets a bit unwieldy, strapped to me like this. Oh, dearie me! Your peacock's more of a bull in a china shop, ain't he, Mr. Winklethorpe? I'll sort this mess, don't fret. Maybe next time we can pop a broom in his tail feathers. Make him useful around here. Winklethorpe, yes. I read about you in the newspaper. I know that you have worked for years in charity to bring children's dental hygiene up to the high English standard. <laughs> Indeed. I couldn't help but notice that curious brown stain on your right hand. One fervently hopes that it's the result of an encounter with a festive plum pudding dessert rather than, say, a clandestine expedition into your trouser pockets to quell the trembling anxieties brought on by tonight's public charity event attended by in-laws. Ah, oh, you've got me, Sherlock. <laughs> it is indeed pudding, but uh, albeit a rather unfortunate casualty of my culinary enthusiasm. <laughs> Far more palatable, I assure you, than any scandalous tale of trouser-bound escapades one might concoct under the rest of societal anxiety with my in-laws. Good Lord, Holmes, you never fail to astound me. Now, as to why I raced over here, Sherlock, the most violent of explosions... Watson... Was do you realise, in all the time we've known each other, sharing the same rooms, facing innumerable perils, we've yet to address each other by our given names? Is that so, Holmes? Oh, I had never really thought about it. I, I, I wonder why that is. Uh, anyway, Holmes. Difficult to say, Watson. It could be any of several reasons. Really? I, um, I can't think of one. Come, come, Watson. Surely something comes to mind. Uh, about the exploding Christmas puddings... Perhaps it has to do with the singular nature of your name. Sherlock does not seem to be a, an easy epithet to use. <laughs> Most assuredly it isn't. But at best it can be but a partial explanation. Your name, John, is an easy name to say. My brother Mycroft has no trouble addressing me as Sherlock. True, I hadn't thought of that. Uh, uh, um, hmm. about the what other reasons can you see? Two, mainly. Um, <clears throat> First, and I suspect foremost, is the repressive nature of Victorian society itself. Oh? Uh, so, uh, 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 gentlemen, would you like to come round the bakery and see what's happened? There's figgy pudding splattered all over the place. Yes, Watson. The world in which we live is extremely formal. Indeed, I would venture so far as to say that we live in a time that is appalled by any display of familiarity. There, alas, I fear the lower classes have won up on us. Their lives are not nearly so regimented as ours, and they do not follow the same restrictive rules of society as we do. Mm. Fascinating, Holmes. Truly fascinating. And your second reason? Repressed homosexual feelings. Well, I, I'm not sure I heard you correctly, Holmes. Come, come, Watson. There's no need to look so surprised. Surely all the signs are there. You must really learn to see with your mind as well as your eyes, Watson. Holmes. Perhaps we should uh, uh, return to the matter of the exploding Christmas puddings. Let's apply my celebrated deductive methods to myself, shall we? Observe. I, a solitary man in my prime, cohabitating exclusively with another man. You, dear Watson. I possess a palpable disdain for the fairer sex and an unbridled passion for theatrical disguises and a peculiar fondness for opera. And let us not forget my troop of juvenile informants, the Baker Street Irregulars. Oh, yes. Well, I, I did wonder about that a lot. And the show tunes. Here I am, a man full-grown, and I have any number of prepubescent street urchins at my beck and call night and day to help me in my endeavours. Does that not bespeak of anything to you, Watson? I've always felt that you were a uh, might eccentric. I am surprised that a medical man would be so shocked. Surely you realise that it is a natural enough occurrence. 
All manner of animals have their quota of non-heterosexuals. Why should a man be any different, eh? Holmes, I, I, I don't know what to say. Uh, surely you know that I... I mean, you've met my wife, Mary. I, I couldn't... Watson, set your mind at ease, my old friend. It's not your affections which I seek. In fact, I don't seek any. I am very much involved already and have been for some time. Really, Holmes? I had no idea. Uh, who's the lucky... Uh... The person? Who, who's the lucky person? Do, do I know them? You do indeed, Watson. You do indeed. The lucky fellow is none other than Inspector Lestrade. Lestrade? Holmes, he's so beneath you. Uh, surely you could do better than that bumbling Bobby. Dear, dear sweet Watson, always looking out for my interests. No, Watson, he may not be my peer in analytical thought, but he is unmatched in other equally important areas? Uh, Holmes, I, I think this conversation has reached its conclusion. I, I, I don't want any, um, details. I'm not sure I can handle it. Watson, Watson, you do so underestimate me, my dear old thing. The intricacies of my private existence are and shall remain an enigma wrapped in a mystery swathed in tweed. But I've been rude. Mr. Winklethorpe, I seem to have been so bent on telling Watson my secret that I completely forgot you came here in earnest. Pray tell, what is it you wanted to see me about? Mr. Holmes, it's worse than a rebellion. It's an uprising. My bakery, the Spotted Dick Pudding Pantry, is under siege by its own Christmas puddings. They're exploding with a ferocity that rivals Krakatoa. Mr. Holmes, you are needed. I'm here too. I, I'm also part of this conversation, you know. I'm I'm not just your arm candy. Oh, yes. Of course, you can come too, Dr. Watson. We may encounter a, um, a medical emergency involving pudding. Watson, bring a spoon. We may need to negotiate with custard. On this brisk and fog-laden morning, the streets of London were awash in the muted clatter of carriages and the muffled footsteps of the early risers. Barnaby Winklethorpe guided us to one of the city's less frequented quarters, despite Holmes exclaiming that he already knew the way and getting us lost for some time. Upon ignoring his insistent directions, we arrived where the air was redolent with the rich, yeasty fragrance of freshly baked bread. It was in this quaint corner that lay our destination, a, a bakery of some repute, known far and wide for its delectable confections, and most recently, for a matter most perplexing. The bakery, a, a charming edifice of aged brick, stood modestly adorned with an elegantly painted sign that read, The Spotted Dick Pudding Pantry. Its windows, though small, beckoned the passerbys with a display of culinary delights that could tempt even the most abstemious of souls. As we approached... The bell above the door announced our entry, like a cheerful tinkle, a sound that seemed to momentarily lift the gloom of the London morning. Inside, the air was warm and inviting, a stark contrast to the damp chill that clung to the city's streets. Shelves lined with an array of baked goods, from hearty loaves of bread to the most delicate of pastries, surrounded us. Yet, amidst this bounty lay the heart of our inquiry the Christmas puddings, which, as of late, had become the unwitting agents of chaos. Holmes, with his usual alacrity, wasted no time in acquainting himself with the scene. His keen eyes darted from one corner of the shop to the other, absorbing every detail, every nuance. The baker, Crispin Oglethorpe Snoop, a rotund gentleman with a, a countenance as warm as his oven, greeted us with a mixture of trepidation and relief. I could discern from his manner that our presence was both anticipated and welcomed. Gentlemen, I am so glad to meet you, Mr. Holmes, and it's good to see you again as well, Dr. Watson. I am Crispin Oglethorpe Snoot. I know, I, I said it in the narration. Most call me Figgy. I must say, Figgy, if we graciously overlook the rather exuberant pudding eruptions that appear to have festooned your decor, this establishment exudes an air of tidiness. Watson, observe the arrangement of the goods, the meticulous organization, the precision. This is a place where disorder is a stranger. Indeed, the shop was a testament to the baker's art. Each item placed with care and consideration a harmony of culinary discipline. Yet in this very orderliness lay the seeds of the mystery we were to unravel. 
a mystery that had its roots in the very essence of the Christmas spirit. And then, of course, the puddings had exploded everywhere. Oh, this is the site of a Christmas calamity of the highest order. However, Mr. Winklethorpe, Spotted Dick is not considered a Christmas pudding. It is a traditional British dessert, but it's distinct from what's typically referred to as Christmas pudding. Yes, I know. I own the bakery. Ah, you are the owner of this bakery, and you named it the Spotted Dick Pudding Pantry. Now we are getting somewhere. Spotted Dick is a simple steamed suet pudding containing dried fruit like currants or raisins that gives it its spotted appearance. It's the name because it's served throughout the year, not just at Christmas. If the name of the bakery implied I served only Christmas puddings, it would have to be closed for 11 months out of the year. I find it peculiar that puddings, typically docile by nature, have taken to exploding with such enthusiasm under your care. Quite right, Mr. Holmes. Puddings are generally known for their placid disposition. Least volatile of the lot, traditionally speaking, would be the Christmas pudding or plum pudding, which tends to be the least combustible of desserts. Ah, but of course. The Christmas pudding is a culinary tapestry of dried fruits, nuts, and the occasional splash of brandy, aged like a fine wine, then set ablaze in a ritualistic display of festive pyrotechnics. A veritable fruitcake inferno, if you will. Good Lord, Mr. Holmes, I must admit that does sound delicious. Sometimes I like to make a nice figgy pudding with saltpetre, charcoal, and sulphur. When did this pudding start exploding? Well, it must have been about three days ago. I was serving a pudding to Miss Penelope Chutney Featherstone there, and it detonated. Just there, where she's seated now? Yes. She hasn't moved since that day. She hasn't moved? Is she... dead? I don't know. I was so mad about the pudding exploding, I ran back into the kitchen. Uh, Figgy, you, you just left a body there in the dining area of the bakery. Two days ago. That's right. Sure. Oh, sure, it might scare the other diners away, but that's probably a good thing, given the puddings exploding violently all over the place. I see. I think I will examine Miss Penelope Chutney Featherstone now. Holmes, with his customary meticulousness, approached the figure of Miss Penelope Chutney Featherstone, who lay rather unceremoniously draped across the wooden table in the midst of the bakery diner. The scene was one of curious disarray, with the young lady amidst a chaotic splatter of pudding, her form as still as a statue, save for a mysterious scratching sound emanating from under her frilly dress. Holmes, ever the observer, gently prodded at her and and cast his keen eye over the peculiar explosion of dessert that surrounded her. It was through his keen observation that he deduced with a certainty that only he could muster that Miss Chutney Featherstone was very much in the land of the living. Indeed, it appeared she had been so engrossed in her botanical sketching, a task which she had dedicated her professional talents in the service of a popular men's periodical on raw plants, that she had failed to register the tumultuous event of a pudding's unexpected demise. Such was her focus and concentration that the explosion had merely served to reposition her rather than rouse her from her artistic endeavor. Holmes then embarked upon a startling series of deductions about the young lady, his mind weaving through fact and fancies with the agility of a practiced acrobat. It was a cascade of reasoning and conjecture that led him to the conclusion that Miss Chutney Featherstone, a botanical illustrator by trade, was none other than the infamous Jack the Ripper, the elusive specter who had cast a shadow of terror over the Whitechapel district some years prior. Ah, Watson, cast your gaze upon Miss Chutney Featherstone, artfully obscured by her sketch pad. Observe, if you will, the tenacious grip upon her pencil, reminiscent, one might say, of a person engaged in far more sinister nighttime pursuits. <laughs> sinister nighttime pursuits? Steady on, Holmes. You've already told me your little secret. <laughs> ah, Watson, observe. Look at the trajectory of the pudding splatter, clearly indicating a flair for the dramatic. Its chaotic trajectory suggests a certain panache one might employ in, oh, I don't know, covering up a crime scene with dessert? Dessert-based crime scene? Precisely, Watson. And let us not forget her botanical expertise, a veritable trove of knowledge for concocting the most diabolical of vegetables. Look at her. She appears as a vegetable now, in fact. Or consider this. 
the humble celery stock, an unsuspecting vegetable, yet in the right hands a formidable weapon for the veggie-minded villain. It's celery, my dear Watson. Our Miss Chutney Featherstone is none other than Jack the Ripper. A conclusion so obvious it's practically staring us in the face, smeared in pudding. Arrest her immediately. In the presence of Holmes' formidable intellect, even the most outlandish theory seems to take on a veneer of plausibility. Constables, this is none other than Jack the Ripper. Well, that's Penelope Chutney Featherstone. She's a royal lineage, Mr. Holmes. Oh? Yes. She's descended from the royal house of Chutney Tart, Queen Eclair the Elegant, who married King Reginald Fondant the Fanciful and introduced the kingdom to the art of pastry. Oh, yes. I should have mentioned Sir Trifle the Tall is my distant cousin who ascended the throne by virtue of being the tallest in the line of succession, and he instituted the annual festival of layers, celebrating layered desserts. Ah. Never mind, then. Let her go. Now, about the exploding puddings. Yes, what of them? That, Mr. Holmes, is precisely why I've summoned you to the Spotted Deck Pudding Pantry. Just as my baker, a man of exemplary skill, mind you, was arranging the new batch of puddings on the shelf, an endeavor he's performed countless times without incident, one of the confounded things decided to spontaneously combust. And right as Miss Chutney Featherstone, a regular customer and botanical enthusiast, was served. I assure you that it's not what normally happens to my Christmas puddings. It's now rather unusual for anything I bake to explode. Uh, Perhaps, Holmes, since she is alive and witness to the event, we should ask Miss Chutney Featherstone for the particulars. Talk to a lady? Yes. I suppose I could uh, approach the subject if the moment is right. Since I'm covered in pudding and still laying here, I should think this would be a delightful time to converse about it. Ah, Miss uh, Penelope, uh, what's your recollection of the events prior to the pudding exploding on you? The first thing I remember is my mother's face, a portrait of maternal affection. She was framed by the soft glow of the oil lamp she held, casting a halo that seemed to anoint her with an otherworldly grace. There was a mysterious, awful scent I thought was her, but I think it was emanating from none other than myself, unwittingly contributing my own distinctive fragrance to the room, a scent that spoke of the less glamorous realities of early childhood. No need to recollect quite that far prior to the pudding incident, actually. Oh, dear. How far back should I have gone? Uh, Miss, I think what Mr. Holmes is interested in focusing on, any events immediately prior to the pudding being served, not every event prior. (laughs) Uh, Tell us anything about recent events prior to today's Christmas pudding eruption on you and basting you in a custard-like sweetness and uh, leaving you spread prone on the table. I don't think you should have put it quite that way, Watson. But yes, Miss Chutney Featherstone, what events just today, or in the very, 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 very recent history, do you remember? I remember just yesterday I woke up and read in the newspaper. Yes? About the weather in London. Yes? Oh! Yes! I decided to wear my heavier green dress that day as the weather was to be quite nippy. We seem to have fallen into a sort of redundant familiarity, Miss Penelope. I am in distress, you know. It is not every day one becomes the unwitting target of an impromptu explosion of festive dessert. Again, events actually related to the incident that happened here, with you and an exploding pudding. Oh, of course. What can I recall? Just that. Did you notice anything unusual? Yes. What? What? Well, the pudding exploded. Yes? That did seem a bit odd. (sighs) Right. In a voice tinged with both astonishment and a certain unshakable composure, Miss Chutney Featherstone recounted the events as she had experienced them. I was seated at a quaint table in the corner of the bakery, adorned with the customary linens and silverware befitting an establishment of such standing. I then had ordered a serving of Mr. Snoot's Christmas pudding, a dish renowned until that fateful day, more for its palatable qualities than for any pyrotechnic tendencies. Miss Chutney Featherstone continued her story, saying Figgy himself, with the practice grace of a seasoned purveyor of fine-baked goods, had delivered the pudding post-haste to her at the table. 
No sooner had the dish been placed before her, an occurrence most extraordinary and unsettling transpired. The pudding, devoid of any visible ignition source or external provocation, erupted in a most dramatic fashion, much to the shock and consternation of all present. Miss Chutney Featherstone, with remarkable recall under the circumstances, then mentioned a detail that piqued Holmes's interest considerably. Just prior to the pudding's unexpected combustion, I discerned what could only be described as a high-pitched, nonsensical utterance seemingly emanating from the vicinity of the dessert itself. It said, Watson did it! Watson did it? Yes, I think I heard that too. Just before the explosion? No, just now when she said it. Stop helping, Winklethorpe. Uh, the utterance, though brief and muddled amidst the chaos of the moment, suggested an element of intentionality behind the event, a clue that, I observed, set Holmes's keen mind into a state of intense contemplation. The next thing I know, I am covered in figgy pudding. No, I never... Not you, figgy. The food. The pudding. Right, of course. I mean, I'm a gentleman baker. As Miss Chutney Featherstone concluded her account, Holmes's eyes narrowed in thought, the gears of his prodigious intellect turning rapidly. It was evident that this was no ordinary case of culinary misfortune, but rather a mystery that beckoned for the unique analytical prowess of Sherlock Holmes. Interesting story, Miss Chutney Featherstone. Good Lord, Watson did it! Eh? <laughs> what could it mean, Holmes? That's not remarkable, neither is the explosion. No? But, uh, Things explode every day, don't they, my dear Watson? Not really. Watson did it. Indeed. Hmm, yes. But, hmm. uh... Watson did it. Unless I'm very much mistaken. Oh, but, uh... Is a little-known term deeply embedded in the arcane lore of British Christmas pudding making. Watson did it. <laughs> refers to a unique quality achieved only through the process as mysterious as it is rare. It is said that a Christmas pudding possesses the Watson did it when it has been steamed under a very specific set of conditions that align only once a decade. I, I think you're very much mistaken, Holmes. Shh. Once mixed, the pudding is wrapped in a cloth, spun from the silk of the rare Hibernian spindle moth, a creature that, according to legend, feeds only on holly leaves and mistletoe berries. This cloth is said to infuse the pudding with the very spirit of Yuletide. The steaming must be done over a fire kindled with wood from an oak tree that has witnessed at least a hundred winters. Ensuring the heat imparts ancient wisdom to the dessert. As the pudding steams, a chorus of carolers must encircle the kitchen, their voices rising and falling in perfect harmony to create a melody that supposedly stirs the soul of the pudding. A pudding with the frumbled essence of Watson did it! is said to have a taste that transcends mere flavour. Holmes, your ability to dress the most banal of observations into layers of verbose grandeur is matched only by your unique talent for missing the glaringly obvious. Elementary, my dear Watson. Watson did it? Oh, I've never heard of that term. What difference does that make, Figgy? I am a baker by trade. I don't think... Watson did it is a thing. Good Lord, Holmes. The daily toil amidst flour and dough, each creation a transient work of art, destined to be consumed and forgotten. Something so unappreciated and frustrating, perhaps, if one sits with it long enough, the reaction is explosive. <sighs> I can certainly empathize with that, yes, Holmes. Perhaps pastries ponder their own perishability. Oh, speaking of perishing... I need to get the rest of these bodies out of here. It's almost tea time. In matters of death, perhaps we should consult with Lady Arabella Fortescue, a woman who claims to talk to the perished from beyond. After parting ways with the illustrious duo of Barnaby Winklethorpe and Crispin Oglethorpe Snoot, Holmes and I hailed a handsome cab. We rattled through the streets of London, the city adorned in its festival garb. Though our journey was occasionally punctuated by the distant muffled pop of yet another Christmas pudding meeting its untimely end, it was as if the very desserts of London had conspired to celebrate their own brand of explosive revelry. 
As we alighted from our cab, we found ourselves at the gates of Lady Arabella Fortescue's residence, a grand Victorian mansion that loomed like a dignified elder statesman of architecture, albeit one dressed in an excess of gables and chimneys. <laughs> it was the sort of place that wouldn't have looked out of place in a gothic novel, or as the backdrop for an exceedingly dramatic opera. Upon our approach, the door swung open as if on cue. <laughs> She stood in the doorway like the final act of a grand play, her presence as commanding as the mansion she inhabited. Clad in a gown that seemed to have been fashioned from the dreams of a particularly adventurous seamstress, Lady Arabella was a vision of Victorian opulence. With a gesture that was both regal and inviting, Lady Arabella ushered us into her abode, her voice ringing out with melodious tones of a woman who was used to being heard and heeded. Gentlemen, do come in. You've arrived just in time for tea, and perhaps a dash of intrigue. Lady Fortescue, I shan't intrude too long. I've come here on a matter of some urgency. I've taken on a case of the exploding puddings. Mr. Holmes, whatever have you eaten to cause such distress? I beg your pardon, Lady Arabella? Oh, there's no need for euphemisms, dear Sherlock. In the fullness of time, everyone experiences a desperate need to repeatedly back the big brown carriage out of the garage. Uh, no. I'm afraid that... There's nothing to be afraid of. Lord knows, just Saturday, I felt like I was giving birth to a spineless brown fish all during my grand ball. Oh, uh, Lady Fortescue, I fear there's been a bit of a misunderstanding. Holmes isn't suffering from a personal ailment. <laughs> or rather, it's the Christmas puddings of London themselves that are detonating, quite literally. The city is devolving into a panic at Christmas time. It's exciting, yes. <laughs> uh, the person who has uh, done it is obviously uh, frustrated, perhaps fed up, wanting to vex someone in particular with a uh, mystery. <laughs> Indeed, it's a most curious and perplexing phenomenon. These culinary combustions have thrown London into a state of Christmas chaos. It seems almost supernatural how these Christmas puddings seem to be exploding all over the city. Perhaps there is a phantasmagorical answer to this mystery. Come back tonight, Sherlock. I'm hosting a seance for Madame Zafira, the famous spiritual medium that might be of interest to you. It was upon our return to our familiar lodgings at 221B Baker Street that I observed a distinct perturbation in Holmes' usually unflappable demeanor. The enigma of the exploding Christmas puddings had rendered him agitated. His brow furrowed in deep concentration as if the very fibers of his being were straining to unravel this confounding mystery. As for myself, I was in a state of pensiveness wrestling internally with a revelation that, I feared, would irreparably alter the dynamic of our long-standing partnership. In a moment of dramatic resolve, I decided to unburden my conscience as he started to pace and play the violin. Uh, Holmes! Holmes, there's something I, I must confess. It's about the exploding puddings. I know. I saw you dip your finger in and taste one there. It's fine. The pudding is already ruined. You need not pay them for a portion of it. Your sweet tooth gets the better of you. Well, you see, um, I, I visited the Spotted Dick Pudding Pantry Bakery in secret, and in a moment of utter folly, I added gunpowder to the puddings. <laughs> it was meant to be a harmless joke. I wonder what Lady Arabella Fortescue meant when she said... There might be a supernatural element to these puddings. You probably noticed I even hinted at it when Winklethorpe took us to the bakery. Sulfur, saltpeter, etc. I, I said I made puddings with that. You, you noticed that, didn't you? I noticed you were talking, yes. I was too focused on the case to catch all that nonsense about sulfur. I do know this. That I did it? No, dear Watson. You, a savitar of sweets? Preposterous. Ha! requires a degree of planning, deviousness, a plum. A plum? I have one here. No man, a plum. Composure, self-assurance. Uh, but the evidence, Holmes. Uh, the baker recognized me, remember? He, he said, good to see you again, to me, w when we arrived, and, and these splatter marks on my clothes. Surely they point to my guilt. Splatter marks, you say? Well, 
Those are clearly the result of your notorious clumsiness with your daily custard pies. Don't think I haven't noticed you sneaking them for the last few months. And as for the baker, with a nickname like Figgy, he's as likely to recognize you from all the customers as he is to remember I was Sir Stiffington and his secret staff at the local Turkish bathhouse. Good lord, why would he see you there, Holmes? What? No, not without the deerstalker hat anyway, they don't recognize me. Now please... I'm contemplating the case. Holmes, the guilty is right here! Watson, my dear fellow, the only thing you're guilty of is having a wildly vivid imagination. Next thing, you'll be telling me it was you brandishing Lord Hardwick's hidden helper at me in that Turkish bath. Good Lord, what are you saying? I was saying, Watson, you're as guilty of this as the cat is of playing the violin. Uh, never mind, Holmes. Oi, Mr. Holmes! There was another message for you while you and Dr. Watson was out on the trot. Fancy hearing it, do you? What? This is Hudson. I notice you've become even more cockney. Stop it. I'm trying to think. There seems to be all manner of distraction from either you or Watson. Fine. How's this? Begging your pardon, sirs. I thought it might be important. I'm Mr. Humphrey Carruthers, a curator at the British Museum, sent word for you to meet him. I'd swear he said something about puddings. Did he? (laughs) I'm not surprised. I was just by the museum two nights ago. I wonder whatever he could mean. Watson, the plot thickens with nonsensical twists. So... You're off to the British Museum Egyptian exhibit to see Mr. Carruthers, one of the survivors of another great Christmas pudding explosion. Yes. All right. I'll keep dinner warm for you. So, you'll just say you're suddenly there now and they'll all believe you? That will be all, Mrs. Hudson. Very well, Mr. Holmes. As you wish. Ah, here we are at the British Museum, an edifice of knowledge housing relics of ages past. Its hallowed halls echo with the whispers of history, every corner a testament to human endeavor. And here, in the ancient Egyptian exhibit, the air is thick with the mysteries of the Nile. The towering statue of Pharaoh stand as silent sentinels, their gaze fixed through the veil of time. Amidst these age-old treasures, we find Mr. Humphrey Carruthers, the curator of this remarkable collection, a man as enigmatic as the artifacts he oversees. Tall, with a scholar's stoop, and perhaps from dodging the occasional low-flying bat. His eyes sharp as a hawk's, if the hawk were wearing spectacles, miss no detail. His attire, though scholarly, is meticulous, a reflection of the precision he brings to his work. His hands have the gentle touch needed to an earth secrets long buried, including his own. Holmes, ever the keen observer, exchanges a knowing glance with Mr. Carruthers. It's clear that our inquiry into the peculiar case of the exploding puddings has inexplicably led us down a path entwined with the ancient mysteries of Egypt, instead of to me. Mr. Carruthers, I presume? Sherlock Holmes and my colleague, Dr. Watson. We're here to discuss the recent... Disturbances? Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. I'm Mr. Humphrey Carruthers, visiting from the United States of America. A pleasure. You've come a long way. Oh, yes. And I am terribly sorry about the mess. I find myself developing a rather irrational fear of confectionery. I uh, do hope that doesn't inconvenience you. It's not every day one has a Christmas pudding explosion amongst the pharaohs. Quite out of place, really. Like mounting a sarcophagus. After closing. An explosion, you say? Here? In the museum? It only happened twice, uh, when I was the only one in here. Late. The explosion? No, my mounting behavior. I was quite alone in these vast echoing halls, hearing my own urgent moaning, reflecting back at me. Now, with uh, all due apologies for the indelicacy, I must confess I'd pay a handsome sum to, well, engage in some rather peculiar activities with the exhibits. Terribly sorry for planting such an image in your esteemed minds. I used to confide in my doctor, you understand, but, uh, well, he doesn't visit much these days. Can't fathom why. You summoned us here because you told Mrs. Hudson you might illuminate the cause of these exploding desserts. I was, uh, admiring the exquisite hieroglyphics, and the next moment, sure, I was dodging festive shrapnel. Quite the fright, I might say. I apologize for any inconvenience my shock may cause you. 
There was no pudding or explosion here, was there? There I was, examining an ancient Egyptian urn, and right next to it... No, no, there, there wasn't any pudding. Not in the dessert sense, anyway. I just needed some company to share my uh, creative musings about the museum exhibits. I am afraid I am completely wasting your time, sirs. Let's go, Watson. Between him and you, I've had quite enough of false confessions for one case. Wait, wait, Holmes! Imagine playing hide-and-seek with the old Rosetta Stone, if you take my meaning. Go away! Just keep running, Watson. I'll break the glass so we can get out. Where did you find those windows? These are decoy windows. I carry them with me everywhere. How about we just play the dirty diaper game with the Assyrian reliefs? Holmes, remind me to screen our appointments from Mrs. Hudson more carefully. I hear you like pudding. We can get all nutty and gooey together for Christmas! Weary from the day's peculiar events, Holmes and I returned to the familiar confines of 221B Baker Street. The day's events, particularly Carruthers' jest at the museum, had cast an absurd light on all matters. My own attempts at a sincere confession regarding the true genesis of the exploding puddings now faced an unforeseen obstacle. Holmes, there is a matter of grave importance I must divulge. Yes, Watson? The exploding puddings across London... I'm afraid the Christmas puddings were my doing. You need not be afraid of something you clearly did not do, Watson. Impossible that you did it, and when you have eliminated the impossible... Whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. It must be something a little more improbable than the exploding puddings being the work of my own partner. Uh, in, in investigative partner? N yes. Out of respect for Lestrade, I should be clear on this. It is impossible that my investigative partner would openly confess to me with a preponderance of evidence that they are moonlighting as a culinary demolition expert. Uh, but, Holmes, I am serious. I am doing just that. I orchestrated the whole affair! The puddings, the explosions, all over London! Look, here, in this modified mortar and pestle I acquired, a common kitchen tool which I use to grind and mix the ingredients for the pudding. This particular mortar and pestle has distinct modifications. A special compartment or unique grinding surface that I use to incorporate gunpowder into the Christmas pudding mix. The presence of trace gunpowder residue in the mortar and my thumb. I'm sorry, I was distracted thinking about the convolutions of this case, Watson. My mind was miles away, deducing that your imagination had clearly run amuck in the presence of that museum pervert. Hmm. This has the hallmark of a far more nefarious intellect. Could Moriarty be behind such a diabolical scheme? Holmes, listen to me. We can be done for the day. I am confessing to the crime. Enough of this nonsense. We have a seance to attend at Lady Arabella's. Supper returns, she calls it. You know of my scepticism of all things phantasmagorical, but still, after meeting Mr. Carruthers and your ramblings, I must seek an ever more improbable solution. Perhaps there we shall find the answers we seek. As a fierce snowstorm began its icy dance upon the streets of London, Sherlock Holmes and I made our way back to the stately mansion of Lady Arabella Fortescue. The gale whipped around us, lending an air of the dramatic to our arrival at the Grand Residence, its windows glowing warmly against the encroaching chill of the night. Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson, just in time for the post-dinner seance, did you eat? Uh... No, we haven't had a chance. We assumed your hospitality tonight included a meal, Lady Fortescue. We've already eaten in preparation for the seance. My personal chef cannot prepare you a meal now, as he was injured tonight by an exploding pudding, which he found had been placed in the kitchen earlier today. Oh, really? Earlier today, you say? <laughs> Precisely during the time of our visit? <laughs> what a surprise, Holmes! I suppose, Dr. Watson, that any pudding which possesses the audacity to explode and dismantle a wall would indeed qualify it as rather surprising. Indeed. Lady Fortescue, one does not typically expect one's dessert to engage in such dramatics. Oh, good lord. That remains to be seen at the seance. Here, 
there is some leftover aspect of rare fish with diamond dust. Eat this quickly, Sherlock and Watson. You must be famished. Get your party masks on, Holmes, Watson. Everyone else is wearing them so that the faces don't distract our dear medium, Madame Zephira, as she does her ablutions, preparing to take us to meet the perished. Upon entering the opulent drawing room, we were greeted by the sight of Madame Zephira, an old Slavic medium of some repute, her eyes flickering with an enigmatic fire. The room was heavy with the scent of incense, and the masked guests sat in hushed anticipation. Hush, Watson. Oh, uh, so sorry. That's the sacred chant of the ancient mystics. Or something quite like it. Watson, a seance of the most unconventional sort is about to commence under the guidance of this... Madame Zephira, a medium whose methods are as peculiar as her wardrobe. Well, if they were hearing me, you certainly outdid me there. With this dance, the veil between worlds grows thin. Spirits of dinner, we are ready. Do you feel their presence? It's either that or I've overdone the twirling bit. Woo! Madame Zephira then proceeded to perform a series of dramatic preparations, each more ridiculous than the last. Ow! Stop elbowing me, Holmes. That was me. Shh, please. We need respect and calm to bring forth the spirits. Um, hmm. I wonder if the spirits are as perplexed as I am. And Madame Zephira flailed her arms wildly, and at one point even performed an interpretive dance about the world's first underground tube railway, which opened in 1870, providing a very short under-river service between Tower Hill and Vine Lane. Lower your masks, as I have summoned the long-gone foods you have consumed. Good Lord! Floating above the table, translucent apparitions of fruit and... Other meal remnants are appearing, speaking through Madame Zephira. Moriarty, I thought that was you hiding behind that mask. What are you doing here? Ah, Mr. Holmes, you may unravel the mysteries of the living, but can you decipher the secrets of the after-dinner world? Hmm? Silence! Hmm. The spirits of consumed repasts are speaking. Uh... You may mock the supernatural, Holmes, but you cannot escape my ingenious schemes. Gentlemen, <laughs> please, quiet. Oh, I am the ghost of yeah. stuffed oh, peacock with saffron and truffle risotto. Who had the stuffed peacock? Stuffed peacock, Barnaby Winklethorpe. Is that you behind that mask? Zooms, Holmes. How did you know? Elementary. You're without your stuffed peacock. Madame Zephira. What can they tell us from beyond? I am here a half-digested peacock chosen for its magnificent plumage, prepared by first marinating me in a rare blend of spices and baker tear infused oil. I was then stuffed with a luxurious risotto, each grain of rice hand-polished and cooked in a broth seeped with saffron threads, harvested under a full moon. Lady Fortescue, I must insist you ask Madame Zephira about the Christmas pudding. Madame Zephira is not here now, for I am the ghost of Lady Arabella's semi-digested roast swan with gold leaf garnish. Plucked and cleaned with meticulous care, my skin rubbed with a mixture of exotic spices, brought from far reaches of the British Empire. Fine, fine. Certainly, we believe you. No need to go on about it. And I won't mention I was slowly roasted on a spit over an open flame, basted continuously with a concoction of fine sherry and the essence of an Italian opera singer to ensure my meat was tender. Ah, esteemed Guests, I must beg your indulgence, Lady Arabella, for a peculiar but necessary interruption, for I am conducting a rather critical study of the architectural integrity of our host's most remarkable dining table. A piece of such exquisite craftsmanship demands a closer examination from underneath it. <laughs> yes! Yes! The most Captivating sails! Yes! Do proceed, Madam Zephyr. I'll just pop it to the table now. Watson, keep an eye on Moriarty. 
His sudden interest in the spirit strikes me as a diversionary tactic. Indeed, Holmes. One must wonder what he's truly after beneath the guise of curiosity. And our table. Ah, be gone, ghost of roast swan. For I am the spirit of peacock and my feathers artfully reattached were presented in full display on a bed of edible flowers and herbs. The chef garbed in a coat of multicoloured feathers and a bejewelled mask unveiled the dish to Barnaby Winklethorpe, who did eat heartily of my fleshy bits. This entire exercise has to be a ruse. No one can prepare that many different meals in one night. Stand aside. For I am the spirit of Holmes and Watson's aspect of rare fish with diamond dust. I am an assortment of rare half-digested fish, including the elusive bluefin tunny and moonlight goby. I am poached in a broth made from melted glacier ice and vintage champagne. I am sprinkled with a light dusting of diamond dust, causing me even now, despite the stomach juices of Holmes and Watson, to still sparkle under these chandeliers. The chef, dressed as Poseidon, complete with a trident and seaweed adorned robes, carefully suspended me in a crystal clear aspect made from the distilled essence of a thousand oysters, ensuring tonight's simmering almost ethereal appearance before you now. Good Lord, Holmes, we, we ate that, yet here it is again. Oh, please, let us continue this intriguing communion with the other side. Perhaps the spirits of our recently ingested repast have more to regurgitate. Very well, Professor Moriarty. Let, let's, sorry, reconvene with the spirits. Guests, please focus once more as we delve into the ethereal realm of the consumed. Be gone, stuffed peacock with saffron and truffle risotto, an aspect of rare fish with diamond dust, for I am here for Moriarty. Wait, wait, what is this now? I am the golden lobster Thermidor, and I see a precious gemstone's bisque that you, Moriarty, promised your soul to in exchange for one successful evil plot before you devoured me tonight. <laughs> yes, you were very good. I should be, Moriarty. Before you ate me, I was dieting on a saffron-infused plankton for four months, poached in a broth made from the tears of mermaids, figuratively speaking. I endured my meat being extracted with silver tools and cooked in a sauce comprising rare cognacs, hand churned butter from the milk of albino cows, and a blend of spices traded on the Silk Road. My disc is enriched with a puree of pearls and moonstones ground into a fine powder, giving the soup this iridescent sheen that you see hovering before you. And. Might I suggest, for the purity of the experience, that we all close our eyes and direct our energies towards Madame Zephira's guidance. Moriarty took the chance to purloin the left shoe from every guest at our table, myself included. <laughs> <laughs> My hot air balloon has arrived! Farewell, Holmes! I leave you to solve your puddy crimes. Meanwhile, all... These shoes are now mine! <laughs> oh, and everyone left! So you've stolen the left shoes of all the people of Earth, you devilish scoundrel. Uh, no, 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 that's too grandiose, even for me. I meant everyone left literally due to my hot air balloon's dramatic entrance crashing through the ceiling of the seance room. And I also meant... Yes? Yes. Every one of the stolen shoes is a left one, two! <laughs> so long, one-footed suckers! I play it into his nefarious wordplay reveal yet again, Watson. My master plan is to abscond with the left shoe of every citizen in London while perched high in my malevolent hot air balloon. Uh, by Jove, Moriarty, that's certainly a... Uh... Intriguing concept you've devised there. Really, really it, it's it's quite uh, adequate, I, I, I suppose, in its own unique way. Watson, the criminal mind never ceases to amaze with its plots. But fear not, we shall have Moriarty on the back foot yet. Yes, Holmes. 
And let's hope it's his left foot, <laughs> lacking its shoe. Yes, yes, I think I understand you there. Holmes was convinced that Moriarty's dubious plan to steal the left shoes of London was somehow the key to the case of the exploding Christmas puddings. And so, in haste, we departed Lady Fortescue's mansion to look for a hot air balloon in a snowstorm. Quickly, Watson. Every moment we tarry gives Moriarty a greater advantage. Dear Lord, a pursuit of Moriarty and exploding Christmas puddings from a hot air balloon in this weather seems a bit... dubious. On the contrary, my dear Watson, it is the only way to catch a man who thinks he's above us all, quite literally, this time. We roamed the streets, looking for an errant hot air balloon salesman. Keep your eyes peeled, Watson. The answer to our dilemma will present itself. Just when hope seemed faint, we met a man on the street named Algernon Butterworth, who claimed he not only knew where a hot air balloon was for us to use, but that in his job as a human toilet, he had heard many secrets. Esteemed listeners, I wish to share with you an aspect of Victorian London that might seem most peculiar to the modern ear. You see, in the vast tapestry of city life during our time, there existed a profession as curious as it was vital, that of the human toilet. It is, I assure you, not a term of fiction, but a historical reality. Ah, gentlemen, uh, why are you in haste this fine evening? We've left a dinner party seance in search of a hot air balloon to stop a dastardly plot. And I imagine you are in haste because you have eaten a a heavy meal and and you wish to find relief, but are lost on these London streets, yes? Oh, for, for a mere farthing? You can partake in the luxury of me, a mobile commode, privacy, courtesy of my cape, and entertainment as I regale you with tales. No, I'm afraid we have more urgent concerns than your unique services, sir. Although, Holmes, now that he mentions it... Judging from your friend's gassiness, Holmes, I have no doubt he could furnish all that is needed for such a balloon. Good Lord, Holmes. He clearly doesn't know anything. Let's make haste. Gentlemen, I couldn't help but overhear your plight. Even if you have no need of me to provide you a hand-worn bucket to sit on, I, the human loo, stand above you in the crowded streets holding my cape around you, Watson. Indeed, uh... I might really have need for your services. Holmes insists we ascend in a balloon, and as you might imagine, facilities are somewhat lacking at such altitudes. Certainly, Dr. Watson. If you would please lower your trousers and squat in the customary fashion, I shall encircle you here in a cloak of elegant privacy. Uh, All right. It's eight o'clock in the evening and all is well. The streets are festive and... uh, What's your name? Uh, Dr. John Watson. Why? And Dr. John Watson is partaking in the time-honored tradition of the sidewalk squat here on Princess Street. Judging by the olfactory evidence, a robust meal was enjoyed, perhaps too hastily. Oh, good heavens, man. There's such a thing as discretion. Unburdening himself of... Aspect of rare fish with diamond dust, it would seem. There's a bluefin tunny. And Moonlight Gobby, apparently poached in a broth and... Oh, a dash of Christmas pudding. Stop it! You don't have to be bloody town crier about my movements. Hmm, we didn't have pudding tonight. Ah, but Dr. Watson, the public has a right to know. You and Sherlock Holmes here wanted information from me yourself. Secrets and scents often escape. Me. I should have known better than to entrust my dignity to a man who makes a living as a walking water closet. Mr. Holmes, I know of a balloon that may serve your purpose. And in my line of work, you hear things. Unsavory things. So have I tonight, Mr. Butterworth. Believe me. Information. Stories. Secrets. Open your cape and stop standing over me. I, I'm finished. One farthing, please. Fine. Here. Thank you. Why, just the other day, as I enveloped a gentleman in the sanctuary of my cape, the pudding he had consumed spoke to him. Spoke, I say, before erupting in a most spectacular fashion. You claim the pudding itself spoke? Uh, What did it say? Watson did it. I can smell it from here. No, Holmes, he meant the pudding, cried, Watson did it, as strange as it seems to have to say it, yet again to you. Can we truly rely on the word of a human toilet? Oi, 
Just because I cover up a load of shite doesn't mean I am full of it. Why, just today, during squats, I have heard whispers of a man in the shadows orchestrating chaos. He seeks to create a spectacle, a distraction perhaps, for a grander, more sinister plot. Then to the hot air balloon we must go, with haste, Watson. We are on the brink of unravelling Moriarty's most devious scheme yet. And so, with the guidance of this unlikely ally, we embarked on our aerial pursuit, soaring above the snow-covered city, determined to thwart Moriarty and bring a peaceful Christmas to London. There we were, Holmes and I, soaring above a snowy London in a hot air balloon, our eyes squinting through the blizzard. Below us, the city was a mosaic of light and shadows punctuated by the occasional explosion of a Christmas pudding. Look there, Watson. Another pudding has met its explosive demise. Do you see the pattern? It's leading straight back to 221B Baker Street. How can you possibly deduce a pattern in this chaotic confectionery catastrophe? Elementary, my dear Watson. The trajectory of pudding shrapnel forms a clear path. A bread pudding trail with more figgy bang. There! It's Moriarty in another balloon. And he's... he's stealing a child's left shoe. Look, Mom, it's Father Christmas taking my shoe for repairs. Quick, Watson, use this contraption. It's a modified bagpipe with a grappling hook. Holmes, have you lost your mind? Blast! He's getting away! Uh, uh, Holmes, we're descending on 221B Baker Street, and not in a controlled manner! My apologies, Mrs. Hudson. It appears we've made a slight miscalculation in our pursuit. Holmes, we just turned your living room into a makeshift airship dock. Well, Watson, every cloud, or in this case every balloon, has a silver lining. We've arrived home after all. I fear the only thing we've successfully pursued today is the absolute limit of Mrs. Hudson's patience. I don't like the idea of her being so angry with us here. It's disruptive. Yes, I've never seen her so disappointed in us. Watson did it means I did it, Holmes. I loaded the Christmas puddings with the extraordinary amount of gunpowder. All the evidence, everything. I am guilty! I see, Watson. Such an admission would indeed spell the end of our partnership. Uh, Precisely. I was so fed up with it all. Wait, that, that just, that feels wrong. Especially at Christmas. Yes. Yes, it does, my dear Watson. Christmas puddings are perhaps best eaten when not seasoned with resentment and bile. I propose we frame Mrs. Hudson for the deed. Ah, Mrs. Hudson. Her uncanny ability to make tea appear as if by magic could easily be viewed as a sign of her culinary sabotage capabilities. Exactly! She has access to the kitchen, the means to concoct explosive desserts. And let's not forget her stealthy movements. She enters rooms so quietly, one could easily believe she's practicing for more surreptitious activities. And she's Cockney. (laughs) Indeed, Holmes. Of the lower classes, drops of evidence, perhaps a trail of pudding leading to her quarters. (laughs) A trail of pudding. Brilliant, Watson. We could say she was driven to it by the stress of managing such an eccentric household. Or perhaps a secret vendetta against Christmas pudding. (laughs) No, no, uh, Christmas itself. (laughs) A vendetta against Christmas, Mrs. Hudson. The Scrooge of Baker Street. Tea's ready, gentlemen. Anything else you'll be needing tonight? (laughs) No, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. You've done quite enough. Quite enough, indeed. (laughs) Well, Watson, it seems our foray into framing Mrs. Hudson will work. (laughs) Indeed, Holmes. Our landlady's only crime is her tolerance of our eccentricities. Wait, what? What are you doing then? Let go of me! A most unfortunate turn of events. But in the spirit of the season, we should at least wish you a Merry Christmas, Mrs. Hudson. Merry Christmas! 
Chris! Chris! Mrs. 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 Hansen. Hansen. Holmes, amidst our jests, it's poignant how the fragility of human nature is so starkly revealed during the festive season. Quite right, Watson. This case illustrates the thin line between the haves and the have-nots. The wealthy and clever can craft narratives to their favour, while the poor, innocent, like Mrs. Hudson, can unwittingly become the scapegoats of high society's japes. Precisely. It's not merely about us as an inseparable team solving mysteries. It's about the spirit of fairness and equality amidst our Christmas tomfoolery. To Mrs. Hudson, then. May she find in prison she is forever immune to the whims of the upper class's absurdities. Hear, hear! Merry Christmas, Watson. And a very Merry Christmas to you, Holmes. <laughs>